Hello and welcome to the Arise interview. 60 glorious minutes of multifaceted discussion where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things and we feature the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Aniagolo. Coming up in the next hour, as Muslims all over the world celebrate the feast of the sacrifice of Id al Adha, marking it with special prayers and feasting. We'll try to understand the significance of the festival popularly known as Id al-Kabir and whether the different sects within Islam today are embracing the principle of tolerance, love, peace and coexistence which is supposed to predominate during the season, particularly in Nigeria. And later, in a country such as Nigeria where inventors and world-class scientists are few and far between, we speak to one prolific inventor who's designed and created everything from a jet helicopter, a jet engine, and a gyroplane to a capacitor-powered vehicle and a power-generating system that doesn't use fuel. We'll speak to the inventor Reginald Bamiji in a moment. Now, each year, Muslims gather for the occasion that commemorates the Prophet Ibrahim's willingness to sacrifice his son on the command of God. He was eventually given a lamb to sacrifice instead. It's the second Islamic festival of the year and follows Eid al-Fitr, which marks the end of Ramadan, the holy month of fasting. And it is a time for feasting and prayers, but also a time for the rest of the non-Muslim world to try to understand the issues confronting Muslims today. As you may know, Sunnis form the majority of the 1.5 billion Muslims in the world, but Shias are the majority in Iran and Iraq and have a strong presence in other countries such as Syria and Lebanon. In Nigeria, the Sunnis are the majority, but the country has a sizable Shia population. But why are these divisions so relevant today and what lies behind them? Well, in a moment, we'll hear from representatives of the Al Habibiyah uh, Islamic Society, as well as uh, someone from the El Bia Muslim Association of Nigeria. But first, here are members of the Islamic movement in Nigeria speaking on Arise News about what they see as the issues between Sunnis and Shias. We had from Saudi Arabia and some other places, where they were saying that now our number was about 20 million people, and then we have 5 million people. That is our, the, according to their own estimate. And they saw that the number was increasing very fast. So they thought that they should do something to bring an end to the growth of Shi'id, according to them, Shi'ism in Nigeria, and according to them, the influence of Iran in Nigeria. Right. So that was so what this happened. Is a proxy yeah. war, you're saying, yeah. between yeah. Saudi Arabia yeah. and Iran. When you, look at it, when you look at it critically, actually, it was a coalition war because Saudi Arabia formed a coalition of 34 countries, which Nigeria is part of it. But the, 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 the work before them at that time was to attack Yemen and then attack with the Islamic movement in Nigeria. Well, the I mean, Yemen, we, we obviously can't corroborate some of what you're saying. Mm. Uh, so let's talk about the things that we're quite clear on. And I'm so, going to so, you know, sorry, so, finish what mm, you're saying. So what really happened was right. that the, 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 the oppression in Nigeria was championed by Nigeria but financed by Saudi Arabia. Right. That, that is according to... Okay, but that, that's uh, an that allegation, and again, we can't verify No, it's verified because he spoke yeah, but on, I, I on media. Verified. Okay, yeah, right. he spoke okay. on the media. In the, I don't know whether in, you in, can in go America. back to the archives uh, and check uh, uh, the interview uh, the Crown Prince granted in America yes. showcasing his achievement. Time magazine was there. Yes. You can go back to your archives and check. Well, we certainly he, will. He, he said mm -hmm. part, of, mm -hmm. part of his achievement right. was crushing the Shia, in, Ni Shia Nigeria. community in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, and then they interview someone called uh, Al Amri, who is of the Ministry of Good Governance uh, and Strategy. He mentioned Sheikh Zakzaki by name. Mm. He said Sheikh Zakzaki wanted to bring a change in Nigeria, and we stop it. What we are saying, for God's sake, uh, Saudi Arabia is not Nigeria. Saudi Arabia is supposed to be too small to ask authorities in Nigeria to kill their people just uh, mm. by mere allegations. 
And that's uh, members of the uh, Islamic movement in Nigeria speaking on the program. They are, of course, Shias. Well, for more on the relationship between Sunnis and Shias in Nigeria and beyond, I'm joined now in the studio by Imam Suleiman Aliyu Alabe, who is a branch imam from the Al Habibiya Islamic Society, a non profit organization that's engaged in Islamic education and good governance. And Eustace Yunus Suleiman Ogirima, who is the leader of the El Muslim Association of Nigeria Abuja branch. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. I appreciate your taking the time because I know this is a, a holiday period for no, you, no so problem. we appreciate that. No problem. First, first of all, just let, let's be clear for those of us who don't understand it. What is the difference between Shia and Sunni, the two main sects that make up the Islamic faith? And I'll start with you. Uh, thanks so much for this question. The, to understand the difference between the Sunnis and the Muslim, one has to go a little bit into the history. The Sunnis and the Shia. The Sunnis and the Shia, yes. Right. So one has to go back into uh, history, the origin of it itself. The origin is when the Holy Prophet Sallam departed from this world, there was uh, a question of uh, succession. Mm. Who should actually succeed the Holy Prophet Sallam? Some people believed that uh, his cousin, who is also the the husband of the, his daughter should succeed him. And some people believe that the person who is most qualified to do that was said now Abu Bakr. So the other one was said now Ali. Now, eventually, majority supported said now Abu Bakr. He succeeded, and that line continued. But uh, this other group were still nursing that idea. Eventually, long into history, uh, said now Ali became the leader and that created some kind of division mm. and a kind of political rivalry between the two is is more political than religious and uh, because of the of the political rivalry you know certain religious rituals will definitely come in <laughs> but even up to today the differences are, are emanated from that political something so those who feel they were aligned to Sayyidina Ali, were now or metamorphosed into the Shiite sect. And the majority still remain the Sunni. So now this political difference that has created the Sunnis and the Shiite has some religious implication. The religious implication is that we all believe in the Holy Quran. They believe that the Holy Quran is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. There is no difference. We, but when we come to the Hadith, that is the sayings of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu you see that some people on this divide may not uh, believe what is reported by people from this divide, and some things that were reported from the other divide may not believe on what the people from this divide reported. Therefore, there will be some little differences. Mm. But we still pray five times a day. We believe in the five pillars of Islam, but there are some uh, minute rituals right. that are actually uh, not the same, right. both between the Sunnis and the uh, the Shiites. Okay, well, let me bring Imam Suleiman Ali Alabe in. Thank you for joining us. So, in effect, just continuing from what he was saying, there are ancient divisions between the two sects, and the dispute continues to rage to this day, creating a big split in Islam. Is that a fair assessment? You see, from the meaning of the word uh, Shiite, you mm. see, Shiite is an Arabic word which means a uh, sect or a party. And you see, when uh, Allah talked about them in the Quran, Allah was clear. That was uh, chapter 6 of the Holy Quran, verse, I think, 159. That's what Al-An'am. Allah said, uh, That certainly those who deviate from their religion, who cause division in the those who deviate from their religion, who cause division in their religion and call themselves Shia, that is Shite. <laughs> So Allah says, Lasta min um min shayin, that you, Prophet Muhammad, you have nothing to do with them. They are not of you. Inama amaruhum illallah, that their fears is to, for Allah to handle. Summa yunabihum bima kanu yafalun. So Allah will let them see all what they have been doing. Allah will make them see it. 
So, uh, and if you look at the meaning technically, it means, like my Sheikh said, it means uh, partisanship to Ali, as he has just explained. They pretend to love Ali, to be followers of Ali and his uh, descendants. So they believe that all the caliphs that we had in Islam after the death of Prophet Muhammad, uh, starting from uh, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, that they all went out of the fold of Islam because they did not give the rightful position, that is the position to the rightful person, and that is uh, Ali. Right. So that is why, and like he said, we have some differences. Among these differences is that they don't believe that these three caliphs I just mentioned are Muslim. If you want to accept Islam through them, now they, will ha they will have to ask you to curse these three people. And generally in Islam, even the Prophet ﷺ said it, that do not insult my companions, because none of you can reach to their level. Right. Yeah, you understand? So, so, is, so is it fair to say that both of you are obviously Sunnis? Yes. Yes. Because we follow strictly what the Quran says right. and what the Hadith say, but they don't, they don't do that. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, they, they will obviously say something different from what you're saying. But, I mean, j just to bring you back in, is it... I mean, many Shia, and we've heard them speak just like you're speaking. You, you saw them on, on the, the clip there. They, they see Sunni Muslims as traitors. Is that a description that's too strong? Actually, uh, they, may say, they may call the Sunnis as traitors, but... That one has nothing to do with the religion. It's but do you think of them as traitors? I don't look at them as traitors. Right. <laughs> I look at them as people that have a different view and a different uh, uh, idea of what Islam is supposed to be. And I look at this one also that we also have a different idea of what Islam is supposed to be. But our own idea is predicated on the fact that we follow what the Quran says and what is reported authentically from the saints of the Holy Prophet. But you're Prophet happy Sassan. for them to exist next to you because they seem to think that there is that because of that difference and because you are the majority that you oppress them in a country like Nigeria. Well, I'm happy that they exist because I have had some of their leaders speaking that there should be unity between the Muslims. We tolerate one another. Even within the Sunnis, all of us are not in the same creed. We still have some, what we can call sects, or even Sunni others and so on. But the, be the bottom line is tolerance. If we agree that, well, we are all going to meet Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's going to judge between us. As he said, that the meaning of Shiite means this. To the Shiite, we are also Shiite. Some of them say we are Shiite Abu Bakr. Why they are Shiite Ali? You know? But we believe that we are not following Abu Bakr or Sayyidina Omar and all this just out of sentiment. We are following them because we believe that majority of the Muslims want them to be leaders at that time and they were leaders. Okay, let me ask you to hold that thought. We'll come back and talk some more about this. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the Sunnis and the Shias in Nigeria and beyond. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, as you heard in the course of our discussions here on the program, the split between Sunnis and Shias across the Middle East region in particular is almost as old as Islam itself. Many of the conflicts raging in the Middle East today are exacerbated by religious differences with Sunni and Shia armed groups pitted against one another and communities that were once a mix of both sects often torn apart. A lot of that is mostly due to the decades-old struggle for regional dominance between Saudi Arabia and Iran, with Iran largely Shia Muslim while Saudi Arabia sees itself as the leading Sunni Muslim power. In what's been described as a cold war between the two countries, the conflict is waged on multiple levels over geopolitical, economic, and sectarian influence in pursuit of regional and global dominance. We are targeted because we are caught in a proxy war between the caliphate and the imamate. 
we are the followers of the imamate and we are now uh, in danger of, uh, of uh, we are at the receiving end from the uh, intolerable majoritarians. We are the tolerant minoritarians. So there was uh, a grand design to wipe the Shia away from this country. And uh, what we are telling anybody that wants to listen, we are Shiite. Constitutionally, we are allowed to worship whatever we want. Absolutely. I heard you several times saying pro-Iranian. We are not for anybody. We are pro-justice. We are pro-justice. Yeah, but in fairness, I have met Ibrahim yes. Sheikh El Zaghzad. Yes, of course. I went to his place in yeah. Zaria yeah. many years ago. Yes, I was representing the BBC at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I went and interviewed him. And he was quite clear that he was a big supporter of Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah, we share the mm. same idea. We support Sheikh mm. Osman Amfodio, who is a Nigerian too. Mm. If, if there is an ideology based, I mean, a revolution based on Shia ideology, in any part of the globe, we are going to support them. Just the way the Catholics in Nigeria are supporting Rome, but uh, it's, a, it's an ideology which, I mean, we can welcome or we will support mm. whoever they share that ideology with us. We had the communist ideology mm. at that time. We had many professors in this country who are supporting uh, the Soviet Union based on that. So uh, we are not pro anybody. We are pro justice. and. Uh, Maybe why people are saying that the, the, the government in Iran is a Shia government. Yes, we welcome a Shia government. And we can welcome democracy in any way, in as much as that democracy mm. is based on justice and fair play. And that's representatives from the uh, Islamic movement in Nigeria, uh, who are, of course, Shia Muslims. And with me in the studio to represent the other side, the Sunnis, Imam Suleiman Aliyu Alabe, who is a branch Imam Sheikh from the Al Habibiya Islamic Society, a non profit organization that's engaged in Islamic education and good governance. And Sheikh Eustace Yunus Suleiman Ogirima, who is the leader of the El Bir Muslim Association of Nigeria Abuja branch. Thank you for staying with us. Thank, Thank you. you sir. And, um, how much do these differences between Sunni and Shia continue to dominate religious life in Nigeria and to spill over into other aspects of culture? Because I understand that it is extremely rare to hear of a Sunni and a Shia marrying each other, for example. Uh, in Nigeria, it's actually rare for a Sunni to marry a Shia. It's because of the number. Because if you go to other countries like Iraq and uh, Syria and so on, we have large number of, of such intermarriages. Mm. But in Nigeria, the number of Shias are very few. For instance, if you ask me to name about 10 of them, I may not be able to get them because they are not in my vicinity. The people who can actually mention them are those who are living within the vicinity. They are mainly concentrated in this area axis, where El Zegzeg is uh, operating. Uh, then economically, actually, we know after the uh, successful revolution of Iran, uh, many Muslims were enthusiastic that at least we have an Islamic system that is working. That is when many of us became even exposed to the fact that Yes, there is a successful Islamic revolution in Iran, but they are not Sunnis. Many of us in this side of the world, we didn't even know the depth of the difference between then and that time. So when some people now bought the idea and brought it, they now felt that in order to have a successful uh, Islamic government is to try as much as possible to do away with whatever is uh, we can call Western government. So. They were not taking government appointment. They were not. They were trying to build on their own businesses. But today, uh, this, the picture is not the same because there are many of them who are also professionals in their own field, and I know some few that are, are in government uh, paid job. Mm. <laughs> so basically, uh, the economic difference. We all believe in what is halal and what is haram. Uh, you cannot go into brewery, you cannot uh, raise pigs, and so on and so on. But when you talk about the cohesion, that mm. is how do you raise money? Now, the allegiance of the Shiite is that, well, they have some kind of backing that can elevate them economically a little bit above the Sunnis. 
And so the mutual suspicion has been built. Right, okay. I, I, I see the points you make. You yes. make. Yeah, let, let me bring you in, um, uh, um, uh, Imam Suleiman Ali Alabe. Um, do you support the move by the Nigerian government to ban the Islamic movement in Nigeria, the IMN, which is the main Shia group in Nigeria? The Nigerian government has called them an enemy of the state. Uh, even though, you know, in Nigeria we, we practice secularism. And in secularism, the system of secularism, you have the freedom of worship. Mm. But then, if you are given the freedom of worship, if you are affecting the freedoms of others, like when they make their protest, you know, the mount uh, roadblock, and uh, even these kind of acts are against the Islamic teachings. Because what we learned from the prophet is that, yes, siru, wala to asiru. That is, make life easy for people, do not make life difficult for people. Bashiru wala to nafiru. So be good news to people around you, don't, let, don't chase away people from around you. So if you look at what they are doing, this is actually what they are doing. If they say they have their belief, they have their faith, they want to let them do it amongst themselves. They should not let this affect the public. In yeah, the but name they they of were Islam. obviously protesting against the continued detention of their leader, Sheikh El Zakzaki, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that there were court orders but they ordering his release. Uh, but th there are better ways to do that. They can appeal, they can, Islamically, there are better ways and cordial ways of doing that than rather affecting the innocent. How many innocent souls have died out of this uh, protest? So Islam does not encourage that. You see, when Prophet Muhammad said that even if you see a pin or a turn on the road that can prevent or cause obstruction for people to pass, take it off. It is rewardable. Can you imagine such a person allowing people to mount roadblock to block innocent people from passing? So that is not Islam. So why I will support what the government has done is that uh, as long as they will be bridging the peace in the society, I think is a better solution. Right. Yeah. And, and um, I'll, I'll bring you in, um, Sheikh Eustace. Um, the, the, you heard them talking about Saudi Arabia and Iran. I mean, we, we talked about it in our introduction. There's a sort of Cold War, a proxy war. And one of the places that's been mentioned, potentially where that proxy war is playing out, is Nigeria. The, the Shias claim that a lot of the oppression, what they call oppression against them, is sponsored and supported by Saudi Arabia. Do you think that that sectarian kinship with either Sunni Saudi Arabia or Shia Iran plays out in Nigeria? Uh, I don't think so, because the population of Shiites in Nigeria, I don't think is significant enough that we can think of it weighing on the political sphere in Nigeria. No. Their number is very, very significant. They are not, uh, we don't, they don't have majority in any local government. No, I understand. But what I mean is, if you look at, the, they claim yes. that Saudi Arabia is supporting the Sudis to... I, I cannot. Them that, from in that Nigeria, is a, that and that is Iran, on the other hand, is supporting them. Do you see this geopolitical conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia playing out in Nigeria? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm, I'm talking right, about. Okay. Because in some other part of the world, yes, because uh, in Yemen, in Syria, you see Saudi supporting one group mm. and uh, the Iran supporting the other group. But I don't think that is the situation in Nigeria. There is no way I can verify the fact that Saudi Arabia wants the Shiites in Nigeria that are not so significant to be crushed. Right, I, I understand that. Okay, let me, let me ask you this, because I asked him that. Mm. Do you think that the ban on one religious group such as the IMN threatens the basic human rights of many Nigerians? Because even the Catholics, who are non-Muslim, have been supporting the Islamic movement in Nigeria, saying that it's unfair for them to be banned simply for protesting on the streets. Yes. Actually, I don't support the stand of the government right. for banning them as an individual. The reason is because since we have freedom of worship in Nigeria, everybody should be, ex should be allowed to express their freedom. Mm. And when these people were protesting, we know actually that uh, they were not violent. So it is the security agents that actually escalated the whole thing. And 
blocking of road, there are some traditional things and some other people that block road went. So there is a better way the government could have handled this. Though I, the Islamic movement of Nigeria is not necessarily Shiite. Mm. What I mean does not necessarily equate to Shiite. It's an, it's an organization within Shiism. There are some other Shiites that may not be a member of that organization. So government may come and say they are not banning Shiites, but they are banning. But I believe when you ban a set of people, they can go underground. Yes, that, and that's a good point. The, so when they go underground, because you cannot eliminate them, then it becomes difficult. You okay. can no longer dialogue with them. Yes. You can no longer control them. That's a good point. Let me so, bring you in. Um, uh, I'll, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Imam Suleiman Ali Alabi. We're almost out of time. We've got about 30 seconds to go. Right. What is your final word about the relationship between the Sunnis and the Shias in Nigeria? Where would you like to see it go? Well, uh, I know that uh, we still have a lot that unites us, we, the Sunnis and the Shiite, because we all basically believe in the five pillars of Islam. But where we have differences is those, those places uh, where we have disagreement concerning uh, the, the, the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, and for the fact that the Quran is not perfect. Right. To them, the Quran is not perfect. We, we believe the Quran is uh, perfect. So I think the criteria of checking what is actually right or what is uh, true Islam it's through the Quran, which okay. they have rejected. All right. Thank yes. you very much indeed, Imam Suleiman Aliyu Alabe and uh, Sheikh Yustaz Yunus Suleiman Ogarima. Thank you ever so much. Yeah, yeah, You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead, including we speak to one prolific Nigerian inventor who's designed and created some amazing stuff that's been recognized internationally. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagulu. Now, he's a prolific inventor who believes in seeing an idea through from start to finish, cutting his inventing teeth in 2004 on a jet helicopter, a jet engine, and a gyroplane, which he built single-handedly. That earned Reginald Bamiji, a former army officer, a valued membership of the Aircraft Builders, Owners, and Pilots Association in the US, as well as membership of the expert group in rocketry at the Nigerian space agency, Nasrda. Since then, Mr. Bamiji has gone on to build a prototype robot controlled by light and sound effects, which earned him the award of Master Robot Builder from the Robotics and Science Kits organization in California. And more recently, he's invented a power generating system that operates without fuel, which is awaiting a US patent, or he might have already got it. He's also created a capacitor powered vehicle which uses the mechanical heat energies generated by its wheels to keep its capacitor and DC storage fully charged all the time. And the best part of it all is he's Nigerian. Before we speak to him, let's take a look at some of his inventions. seeing here is a self-reliant fuelless power generator as we can see it has two compartments this particular compartment or unit is where power is being generated it is a system of permanent magnet rotating at a very high speed spinning at almost 3600 rpm to generate a DC voltage and this DC voltage is then multiplied in the system with our device inside called chisel and it can multiply to 96 from 12 volt to 96 volt dc and when such 
voltage is generated is stored. And here we look at the power supply unit. The power supply unit is made of capacitors and other components. Mostly capacitors do not store energy for a very long time. But what we do here is still supply electricity to your home. So what we do, we connect this system, the power generating unit, to the power supply through this cable. And when we connect it through this cable to the back here, it enters through here. Now, when it enters through here, it continues to supply the capacitors. And capacitors can be charging and supplying at the same time. So this system can continue working 24 hours non-stop. And the unique thing about the system is that while it's operating and supplying energy, voltage doesn't drop. Instead, voltage will be rising because it's generating and storing. Well, I'm delighted to welcome the inventor, Reginald Bamiji, to our studios. I tell you what, you're buying all the drinks tonight. So <laughs> surely you've made a lot of money. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much <laughs> indeed for yeah, coming in. Yeah, thank you very and, uh, much. And it's great to see you again. Mm. The first time I met you mm. was, I think it was 2003, 2004. Correct. When you had just built your helicopter. That's very I true. I drove, mm. I came from London, yes. I drove to Joss yes. and saw you actually doing your stuff with yes. your helicopter. Yes. And I was absolutely amazed. <laughs> and since that time, mm. you've created a lot more. That's very Tell true. us how the journey has been. Well, the journey has not been easy because, uh, number one, there are no sponsors. And I'm the kind of person that I'm so determined. I don't care about how the money comes, but I'm so determined to ensure the moment I, I decide to do something, I must achieve it. I won't give up. So well, when their supports are not coming, mm. I continue with many of these inventions, researching, and that's how I came about the car, came about the, this generator, and the recent one you just saw now, which is, I, I finished this about uh, a few months ago, mm. and it, in fact, it's a very unique system. Is that what you see here, the two systems there can solve the problem of electricity in this country. Because what we do with this new system we have here, it, we can build it into megawatts, and then it will be community by community supply. For example, we look at this community, how many megawatts do they need? Mm. So what we do now, we build and drop. So, so it's very specific, very specific to that community. community. Right. Now go to another. So it helps and, um, to eliminate the idea of maybe a hydro station transmitting from one place to yes. another. But with this one now, we can just build it, drop it there, and everybody pull it to his house. That's brilliant. Yes. Yeah, and is anybody talking to you about this in Nigeria? Yeah, we have uh, entered into several partnerships, but... Recently, I have uh, decided to um, go into mini assembling plants. We want to start producing ourselves within the country. That, that's where you formed your, your company, uh, Glims, Glims Industries. Industries. Right. And uh, we have also partnered with a company call, called uh, Novacraft. I'm the MD of that company to right. Novacraft. So we are partnering together to see how we will start producing those things locally. Mm. And then reaching out to people with it. Because we have a lot of problems here, issue of power. Oh yeah, no, no, no absolutely. I mean, I, I would think that mm. apart from the fact that there are power problems, yes. the fact that you're a Nigerian, yes. and I know that your equipment, a lot of the stuff you've invented has been tested internationally, sure, sure. and found to have met international standards, because you've received a lot of certificates, sure. some of which I have seen. Yes. Um, it, beyond that, that fact, it, it's, it's, you're a Nigerian. Correct. And I mean, you can't develop a country without mm. science and technology. Yeah. Absolutely essential. And, and to have your own homegrown mm. science and technology mm. keeps the, the wealth within the country. Mm. Now, um, I, I'm just wondering, how did you arrive here? You didn't come with your car or something. <laughs> no, come with I the, came with a normal car. <laughs> okay, right. And you, you didn't sort of fly in on your head. No, no, I didn't fly. Anything, right? <laughs> and, and how long have you been inventing things and sort of tinkering around. I mean, you, yeah. you're an, you were an army officer. Sure. Right. Yeah, while in the army, I actually discovered, you know, the, the moment I was able to discover my gift, mm. where I belong. 
Because I, actually I discovered I don't belong to the army. I'm not having the satisfaction in the army. In the, while in the army, I, I started building the, the jet helicopter in my garage. That was in Enugu then, 82 Division. Mm -hmm. I started building the aircraft there. But eventually, okay, I you were part of 82, 82 Div, Div, yes. the people who built a gate across. Yes, the that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> across the across road. the road to that's the airport. True. <laughs> that is true. Uh, but if, in fact, I have to start building it from there. I couldn't cope with the army and all those things. So I have to move along with my gift because remain the army. Well, I will grow. My mates have been generous now in the mm -hmm. army, but the issue is that even if I've grown to be a general in the army, I still will not have that satisfaction. My satisfaction is in my invention. It gave me so much joy. Well, I have to be honest <laughs> with you. We are very, very glad that yeah. you went with the invention. Yes. I mean, the army is obviously important yes. in mm. its own way, yes. but uh, the I invention's absolutely mm. critical, mm. Um, you know, to development. Yeah. And, and I like the idea of a car that is fuel-less. That's correct. And uses the mechanical heat mm. generated by its wheels, by wheels to keep yeah. itself fully charged yes. all, the all the time. I mean, especially in today's world mm. where we're, we're talking about, you know, climate change mm. and fossil fuels and, and, of course, the possibility that Nigeria will run out of oil at some point. Mm. How did you come up with that idea? Well, I look at the our own environment, particularly in Africa. Mm. You know, we have been hearing about this electric car and the rest. Those electric cars in most of those developed countries cannot operate here mm. because we don't have the charging stations. And, and if we're we, looking at your car yes. now on the screen. And now if, it is if we are supposed to operate it in Nigeria, mm. we have to devise a mechanism where it's supposed to fit into our society. Yes. That's why I decided to go into that invention looking for a way where the, the car will be charging itself. Now, the wheels will be charging while the car is moving. Now, when the, the car is stationary, there's a static charging system also in the car. Mm. Like maybe you're in a hold-up or anything, then it will be also be charging at the same time. The moment you start moving, that one goes off mm. and the wheels takes over. But have you talked to big car manufacturers? I mean, you know, you've got Innocence and a lot of people yeah. like that in Nigeria. Yeah, I mean, we, we, that we have a, a discussion one time with the company I'm partially working with as the mm. um, Nova Crafts. And uh, they were making efforts to maybe meet with most of these uh, uh, innocent and the rest of the mm. people. But to be sincere with you, to me, I felt because... You want to do your own I, thing, I want to basically. do it my yes, own. Yes, I understand mm. that. You don't want somebody else taking over what No, no, no we can done. bring in people yes. uh, to, right. uh, to, go, to work with us. Yes, and, and, and how many inventions have there been now in total that, that you've made? Yeah, now the, I, I mean, think, the first one was the jet helicopter. The jet helicopter. Right. Well, I have about eight of them now, including this last one you've, mm. you've seen. This is the eighth one now. Well, you know what I decided to do? I so what do you do? Wake up in the morning and say, right, today it's mm. going to be a generator. No, okay, like for example, about two weeks ago, mm. we are on the dining table eating with my wife, and she said, Daddy, I am tired of buying kerosene. I am tired of, I can't be buying gas. Do something about this thing. I said, no problem, give me something. And then eventually we came up with a, a, a cooking device mm. that you don't need, and you don't need an uh, is, is your wife still the same person <laughs> that I met when I did? No, I didn't change. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's the same person right, you met. Okay. So then she said, okay, go, go think of something like that. Eventually we did, uh, the following, I said, give me some little time. After a few days, I said, look, we are going to produce it. Mm. Now you don't need, you don't need, uh, Nepa, you don't need Nepa. You don't need gas, you don't need kerosene, you don't need anything. Just there, you own it, finish your cooking and go off. Okay, let mm. me ask you to hold on. We're <laughs> okay, going to talk some you. more about this. Okay. You're watching the Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with the prolific Nigerian inventor and former Army officer Reginald Bamiji. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. My guest in this segment of the program is a former military officer and currently president and founder of Glimpse Industries Limited, Reginald Bamiji, who is a respected inventor, astronomer, roboticist, pilot and aviation mechanic. Reginald holds 36 aviation certificates from pilot instrument proficiency to aviation maintenance. Among his creations are a jet helicopter, a jet engine, a gyroplane, a self-charging electric car, uh, a self-charging power generator, and a magnet battery charger, to mention a few. In 2003, he built and flew his jet helicopter and gyroplane successfully and was commended by the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. But it's not just his inventions. Mr. Bamiji is keen to see more scientists and inventors across Nigeria, like these three young men whose creative inventions have taken them beyond the shores of Nigeria. Take a listen. My name is Obaid Rahman Suleiman. I'm from Kano State. My name is Abdulafis Adebayo. I'm from Kaduna State. My name is Mustafa Sani. I'm from Dora, Kaduna State. We are undergraduate students of Bayer University, Kano, and we are currently in the Hold Prize Accelerator in the United Kingdom. We are among the top 40 finalists in the world's largest student competition. We qualified out of a pool of 450,000 students across the world. We are hoping to qualify for the top six and pitch our endeavor at the United Nations for the $1 million cash prize. We developed a solar technology that transforms agricultural waste into smokeless, long burning charcoal briquettes for Nigerian households. We use our technology to reduce unemployment by empowering youth in rural Nigeria. We noticed that there is huge youth unemployment in rural communities in Nigeria. And these same communities produce enormous agricultural waste from farming, which are burned or left to rot. Our technology connects these two problems in a long-lasting solution. Our charcoal briquette serves as a reliable alternative to charcoal, which is 1.7 million trees cut down daily in Nigeria for its production. Our solution has the potential to save more than 25 million trees in 10 years. We are currently running the pilot of our project Kura Kano State where we created three jobs and we also closed down sites where the farmers dumped crop waste. During our pilot, we were able to provide our smokeless charcoal briquettes for 35 households. We are now seeking the help of Nigerians to embark on this journey with us by supporting us in developing our technology because we cannot do this alone. If successful in this competition, our technology will create 10,000 jobs for Nigerians in just 10 years. We are asking you to please share and repost. Brycol is a solution whose time has come. Join us. And that's three young men who are doing extraordinary things around the world. And of course, a man who's been doing those extraordinary things for a long time is Reginald Bamiji, the Nigerian inventor and former army officer, and he's with me in the studio. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Charles. And I could see you mm. smiling when mm. we were looking at that. Yes. That would have taken you back to your student days. Mm, yes, yes. Um, and and let, let me ask you this. I mean, were, were you very bright as a student in school? I mean, you, were you into science subjects and things like that? Yeah, actually, I'm into science subjects. But I cannot just say maybe I'm too brilliant. <laughs> I'm just the way I am. Right. But to me, I felt it's not the issue of being brilliant or anything. I felt it's a special gift. I'm working on my gift mm. to achieve such things. It's not the issue of whether one is so brilliant in the school, but I know school added a bit. Mm. But it's not the issue of being too brilliant. It's the issue of using the gift that God has given me. And, and I mean, just looking at those three yeah. young men, mm. Um, and what they're clearly doing, which has taken them, I mean, they, they made that video from the UK. Yes. Um, it's taken them international, mm. as it has um, also taken you, you've got like certificates from yeah. the Robotics Association and all that from yeah. the US. I mean, d did you find that growing up, you know, in this Nigerian environment encouraged or discouraged you to become an inventor? Actually, all over the world, to be an inventor is not that e easy venture. Mm. Talk less of our own environment. But the government, the government are not even actually helping matters. 
they are not. Because uh, the government will come, look at a project like this, they broadcast this, and that is all. Nothing happened for that. But I don't want to t uh, go that direction. Mm. That's why I'm going looking at individuals, people that are like-minded, that we can put our heads together to ensure that we succeed in this thing. What they are doing actually is good, but uh, well, we are still talking about the ozone layer. Mm. What, they, what they did did not solve the issue of ozone layer. Instead, it added more problems, but we can, well, kudos to them. Mm. They have actually tried. And um, as I said, uh, I mean, you, 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 in, in that context, yes. you found growing up in Nigeria, you found it to yeah. be a challenge, it basically. It is a real challenge. Of, of doing the sort of work that yes, you're doing. A real challenge, because hardly people will believe it. When I started building my aircraft, you know, many people were laughing at me. Ah, what is he doing? Every day they would come and ask me, as if loan. No, all, all the ways mm. of discouragement. Nobody comes to say, okay, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you. I started building that aircraft with nothing, with 30,000 naira. And that 30,000 naira was given to my wife for a business. It gave me. We put it there. I wasn't going to anybody. Anyway, I get little money, like 10,000 now. Mm. 9,000, we go to it. And I tell my wife, let's tie our stomach. We used 1,000. That's how we started. That's determination. That is and, the and determination. Discipline. So if we are looking at the government, it will not help. It will help. Although I think it's important to be looking at yeah. that, and, and hopefully somebody mm. interesting is well, watching the Well, with the present government, pro probably. Right. Yeah. But, but the, the important thing mm. is that beyond your inventions, yes. you're also showing how important it is to be a determined person. And you've managed to turn those things that were probably disadvantages mm. into advantages. Sure. You no, know, the... There are a lot of discouragement, but apart from that, you know, if you are determined to achieve something, you don't worry about the obstacles. Mm. You don't bother about it. no matter how the obstacle comes, all you are looking at is the goal. But I mean, not the, the, the challenge in your case mm. as well, mm. which I imagine mm. would have taken you to the heights of enthusiasm yes. and then to the depths of disappointment. Sure. Because you were telling me during mm. the break, yes. because I remember meeting you mm. during the regime yes. of, of, of Obasanjo. And um, I remember I was actually doing a documentary on the space agency. Yes. And, and that was, they had mentioned you. Mm. And so we went to see you and yes. see what you, you had built. Yes. And uh, President Obasanjo made money available for sure. your stuff to be developed. But it never quite happened. It what, never what, happened. What was the story there? Well, <laughs> we don't want to say the story here. <laughs> I think we just a change of government, <laughs> no, lack actually, of continuity, no, no, it wasn't even the change money of being government. embezzled. I mean, it was the same government. Right. Mm, something happened along the line. Something happened. I don't want just to go into, into the depth right. of it. And, and do you when, you, when you, when you create these things, mm. do you become like a man obsessed? I mean, you're, you're sort of sitting sure. there, you don't want anybody to interrupt sure. you, and it's like, you know, I'm trying to get something to mm. work, mm. And, and I don't want to be interrupted. Sure. Even my wife, she does not interrupt. Mm. The moment she see me I mean, in she that wouldn't mood, dare No, no, she won't. She, won't. <laughs> she understands like it very, because she's very, very supportive. So she understood it very well, so she gave me all the support, and when I'm telling her I'm into this, mm. What she does is she gives me the support very well. But does it strike you that for a country mm. desperate to expand its manufacturing base mm. like Nigeria, mm. I mean, every time you listen to successive presidents mm. come out and say, you know, we want to grow our manufacturing sector, mm. we want to do this, empower Nigerians, I mean, you would have thought that they would by now be aggressively courting you. Yeah, you know, the issue is that even the, if the, the government might be very interested, but the people, mm. people working with the government, they might not be interested. They don't All follow the, things. What they, they might be right. interested is just the money that comes in. They are not interested, but the government might be very, very interesting. It's just the people that will work with the government right. and the people that will work with the inventors. But, but the what, about, what about investors? I mean, private investors. Yeah, so. that's, that's the direction we have taken right. now. That's the direction we are taking, and we are having a lot of investors coming in now. And that's why we are looking at the direction of having our assembling plan. We mm. bring, we'll bring out all these things within yes. a very short time. And, and, and you're confident mm. that your inventions can potentially be commercial success? Sure, 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 sure. 
as I speak to you now in Angola, I've just spoken with them today. They are making real plans for us. In the U.S., there are also people I've been talking with, and they are, they are saying, I should, we, we should, they are, the agreement they sent, but I've not yet signed with them yet, because there is, we have a lot of potential with these uh, projects. Well, uh, mm -hmm. Reginald Bamiji, mm -hmm. I wish you all the very Thank best. Thank you very and much. keep Charles. doing what you're doing. Thank you, Charles. Never relent. No, Reginald Bamiji, the prolific Nigerian inventor. Thank you well, very much. Well, that's it for this edition of The Arise Interview. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye and thank you for watching.